So we're back from our trip to the East Coast, and uh, as we're passing through by Quebec City, um, it, 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 it brings up a bit of history for me uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, but first of all, we got yesterday here, we're home now, we got four inches of snow yesterday. This is almost the end of April. I, I don't know what's going on. Spring's kind of messing with us, but it's all melted away now. And, uh, but we're coming through Quebec City, there's, there's like three feet of snow there. But we're passing the, the Plains of Abraham, so the battle for Quebec, which uh, I'm, I'm going to bring up a, a follower that, that wrote to us and he said, I love your history by the hearth. So I've always talked about it's always a wee bit of history. So, so th those, those four words really struck a chord with me, history by the hearth. So a wee bit of history by the hearth this morning about the, uh, the Battle of Quebec, better known as the Battle of the Plains of Abraham actual battle for the Plains of Abraham takes place on September 13th, 1759. And the two main characters are uh, General Marquis de Montcalm and General James Wolfe. But before we get into that actual battle, if we look at how the war's gone up to that point, so the Seven Years' War or the French and Indian War, whichever you want to call it, it hasn't gone very well for the English. In fact, it's gone very bad for them. It could best be characterized by a lot of victories by the French. So General Braddock has amassed the largest army the British have ever put on the colonies. He's defeated. Uh, Montcalm is able to, to, to disperse a large, much larger force than himself at a little place that later would be called or renamed Fort Ticonderoga. War's not going well. Uh, the turning point happens just prior to the, the Plains of Abraham where the British are able to take for, Fortress Louisbourg. Uh, in, in Cape Breton, what's known as Cape Breton today, and numerous other outposts uh, in Atlantic Canada. And, and, and a 31-year-old brigadier general at the time named James Wolfe sort of distinguishes himself and is pivotal in the taking of Fort Louisbourg. Uh, so now the, the St. Lawrence, the entire St. Lawrence, which has been a fortress for, for, the, for the French side, is now opened up to the British fleet, and that's a powerful thing to have to contend with. There's, a, there's another reason why this, this wee bit of history fascinates me. It's because my wife is related to the Wolf clan. Her surname is Wolf with an E. Um, I believe, and I, I'm, I'm not exactly sure, but I believe she's related to Wolf, James Wolf's brother. Um, so, so anyway, James, he's, he's a really poor choice. Um, William Pitt, he's selected him because, because of his valor at, at uh, Fortress Louisbourg. But he's a thin man, he's sickly, he's prone to rheumatism, he's, uh, he gets frequent bouts of bladder infection, and in fact the man's dying. Uh, and he's, he's sent over there with one of the largest amassed armies on the planet, and, and, uh, and he's a dying man. And basically he's seeking a noble death, I think. He, he, he wants to go out as a proud person, proud for his family, all that good stuff. And, and he leads his men accordingly. So now he's back in London, England, uh, getting prepared for this invasion of the heartland, or the very heart, if you would, of New France. To set the stage, um, you try to put yourself back to 1759. When James Wolfe leaves England, he's got a quarter of the British fleet, the largest navy on the planet. Uh, he's got, uh, let's see, 29 ships of the line, each carrying 800, uh, 800 souls. He's got 22 frigates. He's got 80 transport ships. He's got 55 smaller crafts. He's got 15,000 soldiers, uh, 2,000 cannon, and 40,000 cannonballs. And these ships are loaded with um, surgeons, ministers, you name it, prostitutes, children, and livestock. And when he arrives at the Gulf of St. Lawrence, if you can try to have an image of this, especially in the time frame, this flotilla extends down the St. Lawrence um, about 90 miles, 90 miles long. And I visualized myself being in, in the fortress at Quebec City and looking out one morning and seeing the start of this long convoy of the enemy approach, approaching the fortress. And, uh, and you know, the anticipation of what's to come. June 7th, 1759, 
um, James Wolfe lands his fleet opposite Quebec City and sees the fortress for the first time. And he's pretty discouraged. Uh, steep walled, it's uh, 50 meters tall. Cannons are pointing down. Um, they've got the high ground. He's out of range, of course, at this point. But he realizes this is going to be a daunting task. So for the next uh, almost month, he reconnoiters. Nothing happens. On the 28th of June, Montcalm takes the initiative. And he takes a whole bunch of small boats, builds some rafts. They load them all up with dyna dynamite, or gunpowder, I should say. And they put one man in each of the crafts. They chain them all together, and they set them drifting down onto, onto Wolf's anchored fleet. And the way it was going to take place, had it been successful, was some one person was going to light their gunpowder at the right time. In other words, light the fuse. And uh, that would be signal for them all to. Well, there's an explosion. They take it as the signal. They all light their, their gunpowder up, and they're a wee bit premature. And basically, they, um, they entertain the British with fireworks and a lot of their gunpowder gone. Uh, so that's the initiative. And, 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 and now Wolf realizes he's, he's really got issues. He's, he can, can't figure out any way he can possibly attack this city and win. Uh, and, and couple that, he's got three generals under him, and none of them respect him. They're all from aristocratic, rich families, and Wolf isn't from that. And, and they're not getting along. In fact, they're virtually not talking. Anyway, much to their chagrin, uh, Wolf decides to attack uh, uh, Beauport, which is just, um, let's see, it's just west, just east of the city, uh, Quebec City, uh, near Montmorency Falls. Well, it's a bad idea because the French are entrenched. They got a couple of thousand or close to 2,000 men and they're entrenched and, and they've got to attack uphill. So much to the chagrin of his generals, Wolf orders the attack. It's a abysmal defeat. Uh, they're driven back. There's, uh, I think, four or 500 uh, casualties, most of them fatalities on the British side and only about 70 on the French side. Wolf's beside himself at this point, so he decides to rage havoc on the countryside. He says, we'll starve them out, we'll burn them out. We, they start bombarding the fort, lower fort, uh, or lower part of Quebec City is just literally destroyed. And they're lobbing hot shot and what have you up into the fort. In the meantime, they go out, they burn down, completely burn down 22 villages, about 2,800 homes. They destroy livestock and cattle. And it seems like a good thing at the time, but this is going to come back to bite the British in, in the winter that's coming up. So August 19th, uh, Wolf's bedridden. He, he's really sick, and it is three generals come up with a plan which Wolf supports. He basically defers to them. They come up with a plan to land 5,000 men about 50 miles uh, up upriver of Quebec and attack the fort that way. Uh, the battle's delayed due to rain. <laughs> the flintlocks don't work so well in the rain, so they delay the battle. Now, Wolf, Wolf recovers somewhat. He vetoes that plan, and while he's sauntering along, recovering from his, his time in bed, he's, he's looking up at the, the walls, and he f finds this goat path that leads up to it, and he decides that's what he's going to do. He's, he can't get Montcalm to come out, and had Montcalm stayed in his fort, had Montcalm never come out of that fort, the British are running out of time. Because once the St. Lawrence freezes up, they're done. They've got to get out of the St. Lawrence before it frees up. So, so Wolf's back down to having about four weeks to accomplish that or go back to uh, Britain, a really embarrassed general with this huge army incapable of taking the French stronghold. So Wolf orders about 500 men to scale this cliff. It takes them six hours. They're also able to take up two short-barreled six-pound cannon. Um, by uh, 5 a.m. in the morning, they've got 500 men on the Plains of Abraham. Uh, the name comes from a farmer. Abraham was the last name of a fellow who owned a farm, and it's, it's a, an abandoned at this point, sort of stubble corn and brushes growing up. And it's a sloping ground. Now, Wolf's at the bottom of the Plains of Abraham. He knows if he goes to the top and gets the high ground that he's, he's within range of the cannon of the fort. If he stays in the lower part of the field, which strategically isn't the best idea, he's out of range of the cannon. Now, Montcalm, he goes, he thinks this is a double, a two-forked attack. 
So he orders his men out. Now they've been at Beauport at, at the far end at Mont Montmorency Falls all night. He quick marches them back to Quebec onto the Plains of Abraham. These men haven't had sleep in 36 hours. They've been on half rations because of the uh, bombardment of Quebec City. Uh, they arrive in the field. Montcalm forms them into three columns. He starts the columns to move forward. And, and as they're moving forward very quickly, within a few meters, the center column gets way ahead of the column on the left. The column on the left opened fire, uh, and there's a lot of confusion. The British open up fire on them with their cannons, adding to that. Uh, the other thing Wolfe's done, because he can't form his typical three-man line, one kneeling and two standing, he has a two-man line, but he orders them to each to put two balls down their muskets to increase their firepower. So the French now are disoriented. They've got their front way too far forward, and Wolf raises his hand. He's shot through the wrist at this point. He, he gets that wrapped up. He raises his cane a second time, and he gives the last military command of his life to fire. Uh, the British fire and probably what was one of the most lethal um, volleys in, in, in history of, of battle at that time. And hundreds of French go down and they retreat. And the story just, the story just gets better from there. So General Wolfe, he's, he takes a second shot at this point in his groin area. He's not dead yet. They carry him forward. He insists on them carrying him forward, where he receives a third shot in, in his chest and, and a fatal shot. And approximately at the same time, Montcalm receives a fatal shot from the British side. So both generals have died. Battle's over. It doesn't last all that long. Certain victory for the British. And um, it's not long into September, and we have a British flag flying over Quebec City. Now, the British have to get their fleets out, so they, they leave a small garrison, uh, a couple of thousand men, uh, closer to 3,000, I guess, to garrison the, the Quebec fortress. And the rest of them sail for England before the freeze-up comes. Uh, now, this is a horrible winter, and like I said, at this onset, we drove through there at the end of April, and there was three feet of snow. So four, five, six feet of snow isn't uncommon, bitter cold temperatures. And, but they've destroyed all the farms. They've destroyed all the food. They're l looking like peasants. One James Murray described uh, in his diary, they looked like a bunch of peasant people when they'd formed their lines for inspection in furs or rags or old wool blankets. Um, and scurvy sets in. So they got famine, scurvy sets in. I think 2,000, at one point Murray records in his diary that 2,313 are sick. 648 have died. It's, it's too cold to even bury them. They just take these bodies out and they bury them in snow and they we're gonna wait till spring to actually put the bodies in the ground. Uh, but the war's not quite over at this point. The French haven't given up. So uh, we, we, we've got the English trying to win the race, if you would, to come back in the spring and the French trying to do the same thing because who can ever get back first to resupply their garrisons are probably gonna either take back uh, Quebec, the fortress, or they're going to lose lose the whole thing. So outside of the, the, the secure walls of Fort Quebec, there's another threat. So a, a Francis uh, general, Francis Gaston de Levé, he's in Montreal and he's got 7,000 French soldiers. He decides to march, this is in April of 1760, decides to march on the fort. Now he arrives on the Plains of Abraham. And we switch sides, that's the irony here. The French are now standing where Wolfe stood. And James Murray, General James Murray, who's taken over after the Wolfe dies, he marches out his men to the top. They got all kinds of cannon, but it's spring. Cannons get mired down in the mud. And a battle ensues, but Murray makes the same mistake Montcalm had made. <laughs> he starts to march towards the French downhill, giving up the high ground. Uh, volleys go back and forth for about two hours. They're exchanged. There's quite a few. Uh, uh, there's quite a few casualties. Uh, Murray makes his way back inside the fort, and uh, and Levé makes his his way back to Montreal. So the flag's still flying over the fort. The British flag and the French flag's flying over the Plains of Abraham, a few hundred yards away. And at this point, they're both waiting. And a ship. They see a single ship coming up the river, and it's flying no colors, and. 
so they're both praying that it's going to be theirs. And it turns out the British win the transatlantic race, if you would, and they arrive at, at, at Fort Quebec. Not only do the British win the transatlantic race, but William Pitt in England, he sends 22 ships, large ships with thousands of men and lots of supplies. And the French, due to their defeats in Europe, they're losing the war all over the world, not just, not just in the North American continent. They send uh, five ships and only 400 soldiers. So Levey makes his way back to retreats, gathers all his troops, makes his way back to Montreal. Now we've got a new commander, General um, uh, Amherst arrives and he leads the British too. Now Levey knows he has no chance, even though he's got approximately 7,000 soldiers, uh, he capitulates and turns over Montreal to the English. And so in September of 1760, King, King George II uh, basically has his uh, realm grow by uh, a, a half the continent of North America. And in the process, he gains 65,000 or so uh, French-speaking Catholics in the process. Anyway, uh, it, and definitely that was uh, the turning point of a, a long, bloody war for the North American continent. And I digress. I should get back at my, at my ribs here. I'm, I'm never going to get a canoe built if I keep talking, jabbering away, and I don't get any work done. So I'm, I've got a few more to do, and I'll have all the ribs done, and pretty soon I'll be starting the sheathing. And in about another month, I hope to be able to, um, to find the bark we're going to need to build the canoe.